Um, hi, well, I'm Lorna. I am really pleased to have been asked to um, chair this event by B-Side. I am a performance artist and a director, and I run an outdoor art company called Gobbledygook Theatre. I'm just going to give you a very brief snapshot um, uh, about into my work and, and why I've been asked, I imagine, to um, chair this event. We make multidisciplinary performance work for the outdoors, usually inspired by earth sciences. We tour nationally and internationally from our Dorset base. And we have also a huge background of socially engaged practice. It's participative and we create bespoke smaller pieces sometimes. Um, things like the Art Confessional, which we made for B-Side a few years ago now. And this is us on Portland with the work and non-partisan activism under the banner of disruption and joy. And that's things like the Knickers to Choke campaign, Pants of Protest in um, Parliament Square, and also a constituency-wide safe seat campaign that we ran for this year, or last year's election. I'm also on the board of Outdoor Arts UK, as Sandy mentioned, and this is a really interesting time for us. Artists in our sector are both in the spotlight and we are a key source of expertise because we know all about the only type of performance which is legitimately and legally available in the UK at the moment. And as with most of us who are sat here, all of our plans were cancelled in March and, um, and our world fell apart slightly, or well, quite a lot really. <laughs> Now, during the lockdown, in various ways, I have melted down. We had our major new commission from Inside Out and Jerwood Arts postponed, but we have put um, a lot of work out there. We have focused a lot on our piece Cloudscapes, which is all about collaborative communal cloud gazing. And we have worked with festivals across the UK in getting that work out to audiences in different ways. This photo is us in the center of Birmingham. This is what it often or used to look like. It obviously can't look like that anymore with social distancing. We have run podcasts, live digital broadcasts, and now socially distanced performances. This is us in Salisbury last weekend. We've also even run a co-production with Teatro CSS Udina in Northeast Italy, where the work was translated. I directed it over Zoom and it's run for 10 dates with 20 performances by actor Roberta Colaccino. And that's just happened, finished a couple of weeks ago now. But some of the most brilliant work, or, or maybe the shabbiest work, but certainly the most playful work that we have made is for our own neighborhood, our own community. We've created a lockdown newspaper with all the local children on our street. We formed a band with our family. We performed um, gigs for our neighbours. These are pictures from some of the uh, 24 lockdown songs that we uh, performed. Um, we realised that our neighbourhood in, in many ways made up of thousands of people that we know on social media as well as people that we absolutely um, adore and that we live with in our neighbourhood. Also back in May, I did win the Coronavision Song Contest run by Richard Dedomenici. And now we're starting back to gigging. And we are taking lots of our lockdown learning into our artwork and we are back. And that is strange and anxiety laden, but that is what we are here today to talk about. The nuts and bolts of making that work with and for communities during COVID. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to stop this share and what I'd like to do is to introduce you to Tom Green. Tom, hopefully you can wave to us. Um, Tom Green has worked for organisations including the Refugee Council and the Writers Guild. He is a writer and a playwright as well as a producer and his work has been performed in theatres and on Radio 4. Tom's here to talk to us today as a producer for Counterpoint Arts, a leading national organisation in the field of arts, migration and cultural change. Their mission is to support and produce art by and about migrants and refugees, seeking to ensure that their contributions are recognised within British arts history and culture. The importance of this work has not ceased with lockdown, as I'm sure we can see in the news at the moment. Tom works primarily to support artists and organisations, including the Platformer Network. 
He produces the biennial platform of festival and also helps oversee Counterpoint Arts' international work. And he's going to talk to us today about some of the work Counterpoints has done since March, including for Refugee Week. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, just check I've unmuted. I've started my countdown, so let's go. Um, this is going to be uh, quite brisk because 10 minutes, obviously very happy to take any questions afterwards. Um, we've done a lot of work online at Counterpoints over the last, uh, well, since March, uh, both with artists and with our various networks. When I was trying to think about what to say, really there's a lot to say, a lot of things uh, that we've learned and we've experienced, but I'm just going to talk about um, one general thing about how we approach things and then a couple of specific responses that we had that were connected to our Refugee Week Festival but I'm not going to talk about the overall Refugee Week Festival I'm happy to ask, answer questions about that um, in terms of all the networks and partners and all the different engagement that happened for that um, so that's Counterpoint Arts uh, once we'd kind of found our feet um, after uh, lockdown one of the first things we did was to ask artists and our networks how things were for them what they needed and what we could do um, we were very mindful from the start about people being given people being in potentially very difficult situations and concern about it not always being easy for people to transfer online and about being burdened with new expectations so we, including surveys, so we tried to do a very simple survey that had a really good response. From that, we then, um, we produced an infographic and that now hasn't, oh, there we go. We were working a bit already on this idea of precarity, the state of insecure employment, and obviously uh, the pandemic and the lockdown increased this a lot. I'll just give you where we just kind of look at there's a lot to take in there and you're not going to, be able to do it in the next 30 seconds but it was really helpful for us to hear what people said some things in common some quite different um, some very much connected to people's existing experience some things very new but we felt it's always just a good idea to ask people we also spoke to our networks with for example our refugee network of hundreds of organizations we had some zoom chats with people with specific producers just to see where they were at, what they thought was possible with very few expectations on our side. Um, one of the main things that came out from this was that artists want to work. One of the biggest traumas was obviously all the work being cancelled, which has, um, um, I've got seven minutes on my club, but anyway, <laughs> I'm giving five. Um, uh, artists wanted to work so we could so we devised a series of online commissions my colleague Diana who I think is on this call um, oversaw this small commissions to work on Instagram the idea really it wasn't about producing anything it was about just reflections and ob observations about what was happening right now to give people the chance to make work to get out there to be connecting with audiences and for also for us to have a new experience of Instagram so this is one by uh, an article, Zia Ahmed. He created this Instagram post. Um, some of the learnings from this, as Diana could tell you, uh, small commissions don't necessarily take less time than bigger commissions. Artists' needs can vary, and sometimes even for a small commission, they're quite great, um, especially if they're working with what you do. Some things work better on Instagram than others but we tried to of uh, Deanna really tried to capture everything this was a dance performance which is really wonderful you can see all this on our on the counterpoints arts Instagram feed I think overall we felt that was really successful and has also given us and we had this in mind from the start uh, leads to possibly bigger commissions um, going forward uh, that are, so things that are kind of rooted in this experience and this time that might lead to other things so the second example I want to give you is our stand-up comedy project called No Direction Home, which has been running since 2018. Again, one of the first things we did is went to people and said, you know, would you be interested in doing some workshops online? We've been doing them in real time. And people 
were up for it. Uh, we then moved to having gigs online. We tried it, started small. So this is another kind of practical advice. It's fairly obvious, but start small with audiences you know uh, to see how it works. Um, this is one of the first ones. And we had, didn't know it would work, but it really did work. Um, one of the great innovations Tom Parry, who hosted it, had was to use this for applause, to use a sort of loosely a kind of deaf uh, signing for applause. The gigs were great and it gave us the confidence to go and do more um, and to expand that program. Um, I think a couple of other things, so those are the things we could talk more about. Obviously you need to be across safeguarding, starting with participants and then also anything when you're having audiences for. You know, Zoom guidance now is pretty good on that, I think, but also if people have specific questions, it's definitely a thing to be concerned about and to take seriously, especially when you're then starting opening out to doing tickets. We then did paid gigs during Refugee Week, which went really well. We actually made quite a lot of money from that. We had some guest headliners. Um, we used Eventbrite for booking. We did pay what you can afford with a guide. And the, the real key tip for us was someone said, oh, you know, put a guide price. So we did a guide for most of them, it was three to seven pounds. And what we found was that almost everyone paid, or on average, we got the higher end of that amount. So we also said, because on Eventbrite, if it's pay what you can afford, you can't have zero. So we also said, if people are on low or zero incomes, please email us and then, and you can have a, a free entry. Um, a couple more things is very briefly, we found, I think, certainly to my surprise, Zoom workshops work really well. For some people, they're much better. Obviously, tr you can overestimate, underestimate what a barrier travel is for people, for cost, time, fear, social concern, so many things. So I think we've engaged, and also the listening on a Zoom call really worked. So uh, we, we'll, we'll definitely keep going with that. Some people are definitely more confident on Zoom. And we had people joining on phones. It was fine. Now, not to say there aren't digital barriers, but you know, we, um, I think we generally overcame that. And then finally, just word things, finally, of course, especially talking about comedy, you miss the connection with the audience, but especially when people have their videos on, there definitely is a connection. And it all, it's different, but you also see into people's homes. There are some people having dinner, there are people watching on the telly, people with their kids, despite the fact you're saying, you know, chat, saying them in the chat, please, this is not appropriate for kids. Anyway, it's, there is definitely a connection. The final thing I'm just gonna mention that we found through a lot of our work, <coughs> Zoom to Facebook Live is a really good tool in terms of reaching audiences. Of course, most people on Facebook, they are just passing through. You don't have, you know, the engagement is not so necessarily that deep, but we had Nish Kumar do a headline of one of our gigs. We set up a Zoom chat with him and Tom Parry. We streamed it to Facebook and then pushed that out. Facebook a lot of people just passing through. So lots of times for sort of discussions, for specific events, um, we just got slightly addicted to um, Zoom to Facebook Live. It's really easy to set up. And also you can stream to multiple Facebook pages. So if you're doing an event with partners, you can go to lots of Facebook. Of course, again, there's safeguarding, there's monitoring those Facebook pages. But that again has to be taken seriously, but um, there you go, I'll stop there. Ooh. I've lost my, uh, oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dom, that was absolutely brilliant and, um, and a great insight into Refugee Week particularly. Um, I'm, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and there's already lots of things about infographics, that brilliant infographic you shared. But I would like to now, um, move on to Kim um, from Take A Part. Kim engages diverse audiences, increases access to arts and culture, builds organisations, develops social enterprises and community-led regeneration processes. 
She works nationally and internationally and engages people and organisations with exciting projects and programmes. She's founder and director of Take Part CIC. She's created innovative and award winning co commissioning curatorial processes, which are developed and managed by communities themselves. Um, they're an MPO. Um, Kim is also the founder of Social Making, the UK's only biennial symposium on socially engaged practice. Today, Kim is going to talk, us, uh, talk to us about local responses to this global pandemic in Plymouth's Coxide community. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Lorna. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim. And I'm just going to talk to you for 10 minutes about a very specific geographic area of Plymouth and why we do the things that we do. So just to give you a bit of background, Take Apart is a co-commissioning arts organization. We take an asset-based community development approach to working with communities. So that means we're looking at what's strong in, about a place and not what's wrong about it and adding value to what's already there. The community are the experts, they lead the process. We are commissioned to an arts action group which is made out of community members and then schools or local agencies that are operating in an area which allows us to all rapidly make decisions and unlock the potentials that are there. So they, they write artist briefs, they interview the artists and they help produce the work. And we work in a long-term way. Um, oh, why can I not? There we go. Um, so the Coxite community in Plymouth is uh, the fifth most deprived area of the city. It's on the waterfront and it's a refugee dispersal area. It has 60% social housing. There's a lack of infrastructure in the local area. So when the COVID crisis hit, we already had been working in this area for approximately a year and a half. In many ways, that's quite new for us still. It's still getting uh, in a getting to know you phase. But we had connections so we could keep working through the crisis for the entirety. So we were having conversations with people about what they had and what they needed. And we rapidly found, obviously, and you touched on this, that the digital divide was a real issue within these communities. They're already trying to homeschool. And then they're on zero hours contract, potentially as delivery drivers with one smartphone device to the whole family going off and doing that kind of work. Um, precarious contracts and just a huge amount of stress. So a very quick thing that we did right at the beginning was to speak to the local primary schools because they were where frontline workers were and where vulnerable families were going for support and asking them what they needed. And they just wanted more opportunity to connect with their vulnerable families and frontline workers through this and give them a sense of opportunity to have like joy in their lives in this process you know it's very stressful and what can families do to be together so we made these creative packs with the local school and commissioned the scrap store to work alongside of us with them um, and they were just provocations to make joyous things with their family so <laughs> this is a family and they they were drawing through sound but not through sight with each other and sharing that's just an example of one of the provocations but it was also a way to link these schools up to more national campaigns. So when the Arts Council um, and bridge organizations partnered on Art Pack scheme, we were able to really just transfer these, these people, these groups right over to that and Cater Food got involved. So now they're running on their own, these, these Art Packs, we're not really involved with them anymore. Because again of the digital divide and loneliness, we also initiated Coxide Echoes, which is a community magazine. So it's interesting you say that as well, Lorna, as a way for people to connect with one another, most especially the, uh, the elderly population of the community that doesn't have a lot of digital in their lives and also are shielding. So we've given them um, cameras to take to become ph photographers and we've given them some online workshops for those who want to write articles and we should go to print in a couple of weeks time and i'll let you guys know how that comes off but i think we're thinking already about what this might mean in terms of connectivity and communication in the community and how we can keep that going afterwards so it's on, its own evaluative act i'm hoping we had commissions that were already running. So this is the Heritage Lottery one about Coxide's history called Coxide Cartographies with Joe Brinton and um, Bridget Ashton. 
And that was going to be lots of workshops in the community. Obviously, we couldn't have that. But because we were looking about mapping, we sent out a provocation again to community members and schools to create their own socially distanced maps that could be put up in the windows of the local school so that you could go on the same walk that um, Matilda, age eight, goes on every day and see the same things that she wants to see. We have a carnival as well that we've had to reframe. We can't really do that. So how can we do it in a socially distanced way? And so we've commissioned Ellie Shipman to work with us on making some banners and marches in the local community. And we have also commissioned a local illustrator to, to work alongside of her on the illustrations for that. What we needed more than anything and what we did more than anything was just kind of threw away a lot of the program and spent more development time, more time listening to people, more time connecting. So that meant that we had to go into the community, we had to phone people, we needed the time to pick up the phone. And so we ensured that a member of our team did that every day. We also went to do things with the community far before kind of pre presenting work. Um, so this is us doing a beach clean at the end of June um, with the community because they asked us to do it. We had to say that it wasn't a take apart when it wasn't a take apart things, that we were just volunteering with the community. But it started then another dialogue, a way for us to prepare to, to land as we came back into the community. Um, we had a fun day last week. We have one this Saturday. Um, this one was the other week where we were, again, taking photos and showing people how they could take photography uh, images for the zine. We were replanting the local community planter and just taking the time to talk and plan with them what they might look like next. We've also been able to invite others to share the relationship that we already have with this community. So Barbican Theatre has been able to come and bring their cafe acoustic sessions that they normally have in the bee bar outside. And we've made a, a partnership with them to have that once a month as a touch base. And the community now can start feeding their talent into that. Um, and we have done some digital things. And that's been actually for artists more than anything who are thinking about preparing for a post COVID world. So much of social practice is really analog. And it's been of a concern to some artists, like how can I keep being relational through this time? So this was a workshop we have with Rachel Dobbs about fundraising. We have one coming up about making your events accessible with far flung um, dance theater. And we have a series on them and we just have hired a digital producer. So it's really new for Take Apart as well to work in, in digital. And we're hoping through this way, um, this process, we have a feasibility study, if you will, that will steer us in the direction of what, where we should go next and create a strategy for us to work in digital more. So that's quite interesting. And we've invested in our team as well. We honored every single contract that we had at the very beginning. And we kept all of our team who are freelance on through the entire period of time, never letting anyone go. We also introduced No Work Wednesdays, so same days, less pay, gave everybody some money for mental health support. And if you wanted to buy like a case of wine with that, that was fine. It was your money to make yourself feel better. And we're working towards an after this is all over bonus. So um, yeah, and we even hired new people. So we're quite thrilled with actually what we've achieved. We're hoping to work towards having an impact study that we'll be able to release soon about COVID and we can share that with you all. But thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Kim. That was fantastic. So we are on to our next two speakers now. Thank you so much, everybody that asked questions just then. And thank you so much for um, Tom and Kim. But we're going to hand on now to Andrea Francis from Arts by the Sea Festival in Bournemouth. Andrea is the Cultural Development Manager for BCP Council. So she has an overview for the whole of a council's arts provision covering around 400,000 people. But she is also the Festival Director for Arts by the Sea, a festival launched by Bournemouth Council, which is now the BCP Council in 2011. The festival became an MPO in 2015 and it is Bournemouth's annual celebration of art, culture, people and place. Arts by the Sea has always aimed to increase opportunities for people to participate in the arts, 
It champions inclusivity, accessibility and diversity. And there is a huge outdoor arts component with large scale spectacular events, which attract huge crowds of thousands and thousands of people. The festival is going ahead this year, but in a very different way. And Andrea is going to tell us all about how they are safely going to do this. Thank you so much, Lorna, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, hopefully my presentation is sharing. Any thumbs up on that? Excellent. Thank you, Lorna. Um, yes, so I'm going to give you a quick overview of what we are doing with Arts by the Sea this year. If you don't know us, we are Bournemouth's annual outdoor combined arts festival. Uh, so we're funded by BCP Council and Arts Council England and produced by BCP Council. Uh, we are, as Lorna said, uh, an Arts Council uh, funded national portfolio organisation. We uh, generally, the festival is generally over a shorter time period uh, to create a real festival vibe. So that, that's how um, the festival format has been in previous years. We would have uh, over 100 artists. Uh, attract 130,000 footfall in the town centre over the festival weekend and um, really just to have a, a packed weekend of activity and obviously Covid like for many other festivals has completely changed what we can possibly deliver in our 10 year anniversary year so it's an interesting birthday for us this year um, so we um, had to think quite carefully about what we could and couldn't deliver as well as what would be attractive to an audience so we were quite keen to do some live events if we could um, we also considered the, a digital program and we also do some audience development and community participation elements to the festival so we had to think about what was actually possible in that respect we um, are following obviously the government guidelines that's primarily our, our sort of first source of information about what we can and can't do um, we also have to follow bcp council restrictions so um, you know there's going to be local guidelines about what you can and can't do in your area and as a council run event we are um, obviously supremely interested in public safety and also value for money for the council taxpayers so in looking at what we could do uh, for a live event, we have come up with a, a, a limited number of live experiences and they are installations rather than performances with live performers. So we're looking at um, installations, uh, some, some smaller, some kind of mid-scale installations that you can uh, enter and walk through. So we've had to introduce a lot of safety measures, obviously, including things like managed capacity. Um, some of them are ticketed with timed entry slots. We're looking at uh, group entry by household or bubble, uh, social distancing within the queue and within the installations, extra sanitization, extra communication around things like uh, travel, toilets, very important to get the toilets right, um, group entry size, social distancing, all of those kinds of things have factored into our risk assessment and our planning of these events. Um, we're also either having sort of one way entry, you'd flow through the installations, come out the other end, or they're in a space that's large enough for you to social distance around the installation. Um, so as I said, we also had to think about BCP council uh, guidelines. All events on council lands were actually uh, banned until the 31st of August this year. So we've had to sort of fit into an overarching uh, plan that the, the council has laid out about how they manage the public spaces. We've worked quite closely with the safety advisory group throughout. So when we've been looking at designing these pieces, we um, have talked to the police and uh, emergency services about managing crowds and uh, public safety in the specific locations we're looking at so they've been quite involved in it um, it's meant that we've also spread the locations of this year's festival out so normally we would happen in Bournemouth gardens itself pretty much primarily in the, in the gardens but actually we're spreading the locations out um, this year and uh, that our time frame has been increased so last year we ran over a long weekend this year we're over about eight days so I can't actually tell you what we're doing yet because we are announcing our 
program uh, next Monday. So uh, you'll have to tune in to the website to look up the, what live events we're actually running. Um, and then our online program will be announced, I think it's the 31st of August. So the online content will run alongside the, the live events. Um, these will include creative workshop program, uh, some broadcasts of previous and current performances, music videos, podcasts, that kind of thing. Um, we've also really thought about, um, we talked a lot in the team about what is interesting to an audience. You know, we've all spent the last four months sitting, staring at a screen and actually do people have screen fatigue and, um, you know, there's so much content available that what actually is going to be interesting to our audience. So we're looking at doing things like um, releasing, say, a podcast mid-morning so you can have a coffee and a podcast and then in the evening we'll release something else that won't be overload of digital content. Um, we also have had to redesign our audience development project, which I'll talk about in, um, in a couple of slides time. Um, and we've got a couple of engagement activities that people can enter into in a safe way and that also you can do when you're not online. So that's a bit of a um, lay down of, of what we're doing. Um, when we were thinking about the programme, another aspect of, of what we had to take into account was COVID anxiety. So, you know, will people come and how will they feel safe? So we've actually um, taken part in a, a survey that Outdoor Arts UK have just run, uh, where we have posed a lot of questions to our audience to ask them exactly those questions. Are you confident in coming to an outdoor event and what would make you feel safe? It's been really interesting just to get the sort of headline responses um, and being able to weave that into our planning. So I think they've had about 4,800 responses, um, 77 participating organisations. And it uh, showed that 88% of people are missing outdoor arts events. So there is a real desire to come back to outdoor arts events. And 78% of people would attend with the appropriate safety measures in place. And these include things like hygiene and space management as the main concerns. So we had a few comments in response to, to our um, audience who responded to the questions that one of their main concerns was about being able to social distance. And would there be stewards to help you do that amongst people who are not interested in social distancing? So we've all been in the shops or in an outside space where, you know, there's people who we don't really seem to... Um, mind and aren't really social distancing and people are concerned about how how they maintain their own safety so i think in terms of what we can do to make people feel safe um, we're putting together an, uh, an faqs so that will have lots of information that people can refer to so they know what to expect when they come to a live event um, and then our communications will also involve information about public spaces in general and travel to and from events and latest government guidelines or all that kind of thing so i think that's uh, going to be key in in encouraging um confidence in the audience is, is just those communications so this is just going to touch on um as i said our sort of community engagement projects how do you engage with communities when you're you know you're physically apart so last year we piloted an event in an area in Bournemouth called West Howe, um, an, an under-engaged area, where we brought a community party day to West Howe. So we, we took some creative activity to, to that community. Um, we can't deliver that in the same way. So we're de developing that into what I'm calling it a treasure trail type format where we're using a larger physical space, so around the neighbourhood of West Howe, um, we're also having sort of pop-up performances that you'll follow in a trail format. And these won't be timed performances, so they, they, will, they will perform when people are there. So you can, you can attend at any point during the day, travel around uh, the trail, so that will hopefully manage kind of crowds who obviously won't be coming for a set performance time, um, there should be space for social distancing. We're not doing any contact activities. So we, we'd normally do things like arts and crafts, you know, lovely activities where you can really get stuck in. These, these will be something a bit different. Um, 
and you know to enable social dis distancing and, and hygiene obviously um, so we're redesigning that um, we were considering what about audience who are shielding and can't come to a physical event and hence the online program so we wanted to make sure that people could still um, experience uh, the festival and participate in some of the events if they can't come physically but also try and provide something for people who are not online you know there's a, there's a large population who actually don't have online access or not or not um, much so that they would engage online so we've got a couple of engagement projects um, one called postcards from memory where you would be able to create a physical or a digital postcard that relates to our theme and that will hopefully uh, end up in a in a physical exhibition so that you're actually still creating uh, participating in something and creating work that's going to be in a physical format and then we've also designed a community participation project based around one of our major live events um, normally we would have community groups and schools participating in a parade or something like that which obviously is not happening um, so we've tried to design something that allows people to feel like they're part of a, a, a wider sort of whole event so this project will allow people to interact um, with the uh, workshop leaders in, in a variety of ways so it could be video conferencing could be um, telephone meetings or possibly small group meetings in person um, and there'll be a walk-up offer for a general audience and uh, that will allow them to contribute separately but towards something that's going to be a sort of a larger whole that will then be exhibited during the festival so um, I think that that kind of pretty much covers an overview of what we're doing um, as I say, you can uh, sign up for our uh, program announcements, or they'll be on the website. So then you'll hopefully understand what I'm talking about when, <laughs> when you actually see what um, what we're doing. And um, feel free to contact me for any questions, and obviously I'll take questions after this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, and then our final speaker. Please don't forget to submit your questions on the chat feed as well. Our final speaker is Amanda Woolwork, who is an artist and curator based in Dorset. Her current practice is a continuing inquiry into landscapes based around a series of research projects and exhibitions and commissions concerned with the archaeology and geology of place. Amanda is also the co-artistic director of B-Side and is going to tell us today about Outpost, a shopfront property situated on Fortuneswell High Street on the Isle of Portland, which has huge windows. Outpost is usually a space managed by B-Side for the use of artists and the community. But um, yes, I'm going to let Amanda tell you a lot more about that coming up. Um, but it's particularly during lockdown that the postponement of all of the planned festival happened. Um, and it has then been employed at this beautifully curated site of socially distanced community exhibition space. So um, Amanda, I'm handing over to you. Thank you. Can you all see my screen? Okay. Um, okay, well, I'm, I have assumed to a certain degree that everyone is familiar with B-Side, so um, hopefully that is the case. Um, and um, we work with the Isle of Portland, um, which is a geographically contained community. That is, there is a physical border that actually, to the actual place and the people and the community that we work with, which has its impact in, in what we do to a certain degree. Um, we're best known for our biennial festival, which is when all the pro so our projects happen across the whole of the island using lots of different places and involving lots of different people in groups or individuals. Um, so although the main activity happens during the festival, the main visible activity, there's a lot that goes on in the intervening months. Now normally we at this time we will be really busy working with the artists, sort of introducing them to people, um, doing their research and development, um, and putting people in touch and organising artist talks and other events. So, um, but obviously we couldn't be doing that uh, to respect the island. We didn't want to encourage anyone to travel, even if they were allowed to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We'd already decided to postpone the festival, which was due to take place this September. And we're currently sort of working on different ways that we can kind of look at how that might be delivered next year. Uh, 
with some changes. Um, but how do we, how are we going to keep in touch with our community? How are we going to have some kind of visibility throughout this period? Um, and build, continue to build those links with our with the people that we work with. This is coupled by the trouble with the, with the um, thing that none of us actually live on the island. Um, and three of us don't drive, so we rely on public transport. So none of us could go to Portland for the earliest parts of lockdown as well. Um, and it wasn't, and our base outpost is very small. It's a tiny um, little uh, space. Um, so uh, we couldn't put any social distances sort of distance or other COVID sort of safe sort of pr uh, practice procedures in place. So none of us were going there and we couldn't think we could do any events either. So, but the one asset that we did have is our window spaces. And we thought we could really put these to good use by showcasing sort of something. Um, what we had been observing, we follow a lot of Facebook community um, groups on Portland, we follow a lot of their Facebook pages and found that a lot of people were making things, all sorts of things during this period. Um, and we just thought it'd be good if we could kind of think and they were share a lot of the sharing of that. So we thought, well, maybe we can use our windows to showcase this in some way. So we put a call out to, um, to people to send us images of what they've been doing. And um, we thought if we, that we could make giant posters to hang in the window, which is a way that you wouldn't have to involve people and physical things, handling of anything as such. Um, and do that. So we put the call out uh, and we had loads of entries, people, all sorts of people, anybody and everybody, many artists amongst them, but not all artists at all. Um, some people who had turned creatively specifically during lockdown. So these, so when we had all these entries, we sort of put them together as um, big giant posters and these were the first two that we we hung which were, were, were quite impactful like, uh, in the street and um so as i said there were like a variety of people that entries um some were artists that set themselves projects like Antia rook who stitched a virus a day which make a fantastic poster when they're all together like that Others who had turned, who had originally trained in art but weren't doing it very often, but found they had more time, so they turned to they returned to their practice and starting to in great big paintings. So we were able to feature those. Others who, um, such as uh, Sue, um, who um, found that creativity was kept her sane, so she turned to online classes which inspired her to try new things. And she says, just to quote her, lockdown has been a lonely place, but I've really felt connected to people through art and creativity. Another lady who had never made anything before in her life, who was also profoundly deaf, found that the visuals and subtitles of YouTube demonstrations, especially, especially inspirational and very valuable. And she said, I've enjoyed drawing and making these things to ease the pain and depression of isolation in lockdown. So there's a lot of these things were really revealing things to us that we didn't, hadn't really appreciated perhaps before. This fa was a family who um, set themselves a challenge of producing artworks every week. And this is just a sort of sample of some of their works altogether. And they're really pleased to come and their posters going up this week and they're really pleased to all come and sort of pose in front of it and um, share that. So there's these giant posters are great, but there's some work that really needed to be able to be seen in the flesh. Um, and by now some restrictions have been lifted and we were able to organise the safe installation of these models in our window. So in part from the initial setting up, because the windows are sort of self-contained space and you could see um, without actually having to go into the building itself, you could see everything. So uh, this was a way of also showing some physical work as well. Now this is the work by Ray Mail, um, and he struggled with extreme OCD and he found that um, making these models were a way of focusing his restless mind and the making of, making of them kept him calm. 
And he was overjoyed to be able to share these and to be able to show them to people by using, putting them in the window. And they created quite a talking point, which has been really sort of um, exciting. So we now we've got a growing collection of all these posters. Some of these haven't gone up yet. Um, some people are waiting patiently to see when their um, poster will go up. So this growing collection, there's Sarah who's been taking photographs of the waves crashing on Chesil. Um, there's also discoveries we made like Shani Galton, who um, is a blind ceramicist that um, does this beautiful work. Um, also um, others such as Holly have been dealing with depression and her work, um, each square represents the blister packs of the um, of the medications she takes, each square representing a day signed off work whilst unwell, for example. So everyone will eventually get to keep their posters, but we're hoping to exhibit them all at some point together. And already we're beginning to take over the, more of the street with other shop windows that are happy to take the posters. So an ambition would be to have them shown all the way down the street. Because this is a very well visible position. It's the only road on the Portland, everyone has to use it to get up to the top of the main part of the island. So it's a very visible um, uh, op place, opportunity. And the feedback has been amazing. The challenges of the project have been, as always, the admin and organisation has been greater than we anticipated. <laughs> um, and the particular thing it highlighted was that a lot of our community, which we were aware of anyway, but this has really sort of brought it home, really. A lot of our community are not particularly tech savvy. They don't have access to um, computers or understand um, things like send us a high res image. Um, and so things like transferring images to us and being able to produce the posters are um, more challenging than it might have been if we're in at different times, especially as we're not able to physically go and help anyone with, with any of this. So it's been a lot of either phone or um, online communication to be able to sort of develop this, which has been, I would say, personally, I find that more difficult than being able to just to talk to someone in, in, in person. But the whole thing has been an extremely valuable um, experience, getting greater, getting greater insight, um, being able to show and celebrate some of the work that's going on, lots of it we were unaware of, um, and everyone being shown on the same equal platform, whether they have any experience of art or not at all. Um, so, yeah, uh, a simple, simple little project, but one that's been more valuable than I thought we imagined, than I imagined that we thought it would be right at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda, and thank you so much, Andrea.